Okay, survey research. <clears throat> this is part two of three parts for session seven, Social Work 5536, UMKC School of Social Work. In this podcast, we'll go over the topics that are appropriate for survey research, discussions about self-administered questionnaires, <clears throat> interview surveys, telephone surveys, online surveys, and the strengths and weaknesses of these kind of surveys. So survey research has been around for as long as there's been recorded history. It is one of the oldest research methods and it remains one of the most frequently and widely used and probably most widely misused mechanisms of research. <clears throat> Survey research can be used for both exploratory research, the kind you engage in when you only know a little bit about a topic, but it is also very amenable for use in explanatory research. It remains the best method that we have for describing populations that are too large for us to describe and observe from a direct observation. Survey research is used for attitudinal research, orientation research, for example, voter intent, and to assess the prevalence of all manners of things from drug abuse to sexually transmitted diseases and all kinds of diseases and uh, use of everything. <clears throat> Typically, the, the most common tool uh, in the researcher, survey researcher's kit was the self-administered questionnaire. In former times, this questionnaire would come in the form of a letter or packet mailed to someone's office or home. In it, there would be a cover letter outlining the nature of the research and their rights and responsibilities. <clears throat> there would probably be some sort of implied consent statement, and in some cases there are mechanisms for monitoring returns. Which of, the, which of the selection has returned it and which has not. And a mechanism to do follow-up mailings. It's more common today to use electronic mail as a mechanize, mechanism <clears throat> for self-administered questionnaires, often with a link to an online survey tool located at websites such as SurveyMonkey or QuickSurvey. There's quite a number of them. Historically, we have thought of return rates uh, on survey, uh, self-administered self surveys uh, as being on a continuum of 50% meaning, meaning the standard of acceptability ranging to anything over 80% being considered very good. However, you should use your judgment when thinking about return rates. If you're doing a short and easy electronic survey around a topic that is important to your constituency and you have very few individuals in your sampling frame, then you may want to consider having higher return rates, 80 to 90 percent or better. <clears throat> interview surveys. <clears throat> Oftentimes interviews, surveys will look very similar. Um, to self-administered ones, and the only difference between a self-administered survey and an interview survey is the presence of the interviewer. The interviewer asks questions and records the responses either using paper and pencil or some sort of electronic device. Computer-assisted uh, interview tools are very, getting very, have become very common. Interview surveys have the benefit of typically having higher response rates than mail surveys. When the interviewer is present, it helps to minimize incomplete surveys. The administrator of this survey can also gather information that is beyond the questions, i.e. make note of other things in the environment, the demeanor, the mood of the participant, etc. Oftentimes, as individuals, we do not wish to appear scripted when we engage with individuals. We want our interactions to seem naturalistic. 
We carry that desire over into our professional work, and while it can be a me mechanism to facilitate engagement, it can also be a venue by which bias can enter into the research. Therefore, when we engage in research as interviewers, we want to look the part. We want to dress like professionals, act like professionals, and treat our research subjects with respect along with a measure of gratitude. Because we like to seem natural, it can be very helpful if we become very familiar with the research questionnaire, allowing us to deliver the wording of the questions. <clears throat> <clears throat> it is important to maintain the exact uh, uh, wording, uh, allowing us to deliver the questions in a more relaxing way, all the while maintaining compliance to the exact wording of the questions. It is important to maintain the exact wording of the questions since, again, wording changes will potentially introduce bias. This is not to say when someone has a question about one of the questions on a questionnaire that you do not try to explain the meaning of the question. If you think of a question and 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 it needs some explanation to make it clear, then make sure that it is part of the interview pro protocol and be consistent with including that with each participant interview. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we conduct interviews and utilize numerous check boxes, circling of scales, etc. However, there are times when we ask for short answers. It is important that we record these short answers exactly. It is not our place as research interviewers to be interpreting what they meant to say. However, if someone gives a confusing answer and you have an idea of what they meant to say, it is okay to make a note in the margin. There are also times when individuals will give incomplete answers, or particularly when you're doing qualitative research, you will sense a desire to say something and initiate a probe for further information. It is important if, you, if at any point you deviate from a standard protocol of an interview that you make a marginal note. Although most of you will not have research teams to supervise or to coordinate with, but it is important to, to think about this none, nonetheless. Oftentimes, when there are multiple interviewers on a single project utilizing a single sur survey instrument, there will be considerable training to ensure that each interviewer delivers their content in a similar way. It is the norm, even when we are the sole interviewer, to conduct some sort of a trial interview with someone who is either very <clears throat> familiar, similar to your target population or someone who is very knowledgeable about your t target population. <clears throat> Telephone surveys. <sighs> it's almost like a blast to the past with telephone surveys. In contemporary times, as really in the past, uh, telephone surveys are fraught with problems. Um, uh, I, I believe I would limit them to situations where you are certain that each of, of your individuals in your sampling frame has access to a telephone. The most likely example I can think of is where I would be, where I would be comfortable using telephone surveys exclusively would be conducting research around a professional phenomenon where I could have access to work telephone numbers. Otherwise, there are so many people out there who either do not have a landline um, i.e. they're using cell phones which are not listed or use answering machines or caller IDs to screen their calls. That would be which would greatly with all these phenomena I would be greatly concerned about response rates and response biases. Replacing telephone surveys and mail surveys is the online surveys. These, these are done either through email or uh, through a website. Uh, for the most part, online surveys are very similar to those delivered via regular mail. 
However, they do bring with them concerns about being able to adequately represent the population. From information gained in the last census, 77% of households have access to the internet at home or at work. This leaves about 23% of your population out of any potential online survey. However, if your population is considered to be a high internet user or a known internet user, for example, if you're doing research with state employees, even if they do not have internet at home, they will all have an internet address at work. There are some, some, some problems with online surveys. You do have to be knowledgeable about web page development. Not that you have to know HTML language, but how to set up a page so that people can fill out your surveys in an expeditious manner. Online sites such as SurveyMonkey do a good job of this for you. If you have a budget for their paid subscription, SurveyMonkey will also give you access to certain data analysis tools online. However, I consider the online tools to be substandard and would encourage you to download the raw data into uh, some kind of analysis software such as Excel, SPS, or R. As you can see, there are a lot of considerations for online surveys, and they're not that much different from the mailed out type of survey. However, you want to pay careful attention to the length of time it takes to complete a survey. There is an attention difference that there's an attention span difference between people completing surveys on a computer versus um, filling out a sheet of paper or uh, talking to you on the telephone or in person. In fact, all of those have different kind of attention span. If you're, if you're in person with somebody, you can stay up with them much longer than if they're on the phone, and the phone much longer than a paper survey, and a paper sur survey much longer than a computer survey. <clears throat> When sending out your online survey announcements, be sure to include your information and consent information in the email along with the URL to your survey, online survey, in several prominent places. Also include the, all, all the consent information on the very first page that they go to when they click the link. So you might think that's a redundant, they're seeing the uh, consent information twice, but it's not. If somebody searches and finds your, your, your uh, website uh, and takes your survey, they may not have read the consent. Also, when people get emails and they see that there's a hyperlink on it, quite often <clears throat> they will just click on the hyperlink without reading the email, believing, and sometimes rightly so, that the more important information is actually on the website. Survey research is the most commonly used research because it does the best job of describing large populations. It makes, large, it makes research with large samples possible, and the larger the sample, the better the generalizability, which in turn makes for a better research finding. Survey instruments can gather data to enable the analyst to perform numerous types of an analysis and potentially answer multiple questions about the population or a phenomenon. Survey instruments also have their problems in that individuals are often unique and when we try to operationalize concepts in such a way that we can include them in a survey instrument, we often lose some of the meaning and it may not sufficiently overlap with the participants' um, worldview so that we get the best results. Because of the reliance on standardized questions, uh, we often end up with somewhat superficial results that lack kind of the contextual specificity. Because we often have to meet the demands of research generalizability <clears throat> to be flex the end of the ability to be flexible with discrete populations is lost. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.
Also, oftentimes, um, the use of, of, of serving instruments are, are sometimes somewhat artificial. Uh, uh, you know, when you, there's, there's, there's a difference between asking somebody about their, their uh, drug use and then having them carry around a, you know, a diary for a year. To, to track their drug, drug use or you know something like that. So um, sometimes it's weak in validity because it relies too much on uh, an individual's uh, memory of events. So, okay, 15 minutes for chapter 15, sounds good. We'll continue on uh, in the next podcast with chapter 16 about analyzing existing data.